740 verbal? I'm, I'm pathetic, illiterate. I'm Cletus the Slackjawed Yokel. That's right, and the fact that your 740 verbal closely resembles my combined score is in no way compromises your position as the village idiot. No one likes standardized tests. Well, maybe not no one, but most of us don't like them. But they do play a major role in college acceptance. A good score in a standardized test can secure a spot at a top academic institution or garner scholarships. But is there any evidence that standardized tests, such as the U.S. Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT, are actually good predictors of collegiate success? Colleges and universities have a vested interest in ensuring that their students are well-matched for the school environment and the difficulty of their courses, as well as deserve it of the degree completion of those courses entails. Good students get better grades. Better grades means higher college ranking, and higher college ranking means more applicants, and most importantly, money for the college. Colleges gain as much from courting the best students as students gain from acceptance into a prestigious university with a name that carries water in professional fields. Thus, the use of standardized tests helps colleges select students that are the best fit both for the institution and for the student him or herself. However, countless research has indicated that there are some wide disparities across ethnic and socioeconomic status students when it comes to SAT scores. And from a basic look at the data, it seems evident that people of minority status and from less affluent backgrounds tend to score lower on standardized tests. But do these tests therefore unfairly discriminate against these people? And if so, how might we ameliorate this seeming unfair aspect of standardized tests? Well, recently College Board has suggested adding an adversity score to the SAT, which would boost the scores of minority and low SES students to account for this incongruity. The adversity index will essentially boost the scores of people from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds and from ethnic backgrounds that historically have tended to perform more poorly in comparison to whites and Asian students on the SAT. If you immediately think that sounds kind of like a sketchy, bad idea, well, then you're not alone because I tend to agree. If the SAT is an instrument designed to predict college success, then if we artificially inflate some of those scores, what is the meaning of the test at all? But before we jump to any conclusions, we it would be this mat that you would put on the floor and would have different conclusions written on it that you could jump to. We have to know more about the SAT, what it is, what it measures, and what it means for college admissions, socioeconomic status, grade point averages, race, sex, and if there are any alternatives to the SAT that we could use. But let's begin by looking at what the SAT actually measures. As mentioned, the SAT is a test of aptitude, and as such it includes questions related to practical knowledge and memorization, as well as questions of general reasoning. Unlike IQ tests, which cannot be studied for, one can study and practice for the SAT, and similar tests such as the ACT by practicing grammar and memorizing mathematical formulae. Once again, the purpose of the SAT in college admissions is to simply help determine which students would be the best fit for a university, and who would be the most likely to excel and therefore reflect positively back upon the institution. One of the most obvious ways that students, parents, and academia in general judges institutions is on the grade point average and graduation rates of their students. So let's begin by looking at the SAT and grade point average. Is there any truth to this, or is it kind of more of a common sense myth? You know, like being cold catches cold, or drinking gamer girl water gives you herpes. Actually, not so sure about that second one. When we look specifically at course choice and college GPA, the SAT is particularly powerful as a predictive measure, despite the many criticisms of it. Barry and Sackett 2009 found that the SAT was positively correlated to academic success, but was 30 to 40% more predictive of academic success when cumulative GPA was assessed in addition to difficulty and major choice. What that means is that there's a very clear correlation between SAT scores and your first year college GPA. Overall, the data are pretty clear. There is a correlation between SAT scores and college GPA. But when we take into account that some majors are just more difficult and some classes are just more demanding than others, then the SAT becomes an even stronger predictor of scores. This can sometimes make the SAT seem less predictive than it actually is, because the researchers also found that students who received higher scores on the SAT also tended to choose more difficult majors and take more difficult classes. Thus, it might look to the outside observer that they have a slightly overall lower GPA simply because they are more academically oriented and taking more difficult classes. Whereas students who tended to score lower on the SAT, well, yeah, they tended to lay back and relax a little bit. You know, take some first people's drum circle classes. Buster has studied everything from Native American tribal ceremonies to cartography, the mapping of uncharted territories. And as a result, sometimes their GPAs look higher. Interestingly, this divergent tendency in behavior shows that people know their own limitations and their own abilities. And that makes sense when you give them an empirical base for those expectations, in the form of an SAT score. Sure, shoot for the stars, but remembering to keep your limiters on is just practical. 
Additionally, this research indicates that when combined with high school GPA, the SAT is a strong predictive measure of success throughout college. So much so, as to put it into perspective, students in the top percentile of SAT scores between 2100 and 2400 are more than four times as likely to earn a B in college than those in the lowest percentile, between 600 and 1190. So yeah, particularly when we also add in high school GPA into the mix, the SAT seems to be a pretty good predictor of how well students are going to excel in college. And it carries over to graduate school as well. As Kunzel has led in Onus 2001, found that of the GRE, the Graduate Records Examination, which is very similar to the SAT, except it's a nightmare four-hour-long waking cognitive sinkhole that feeds into the souls of all those who take it and no amount of hours spent rereading all of your favorite Daredevil comics beforehand could possibly reduce your stress for it, is similarly correlated with the graduate-level GPA, both in the first year and cumulatively. According to these data, scores on the GRE predicted 50% of the variance in graduate GPA, which was increased to 54% when undergraduate GPA was also included in the model. So, again indicating that it seems the SAT is probably the strongest predictor. Standardized tests are good at predicting this stuff. Further, the SAT can kind of predict major choice, as Sackett and Kunzel 2018 report, with the highest scores in math and verbal reasoning being related to majoring mathematics and English, respectively. Wow, what a shock there. In contrast, those with the lowest scores tended to gravitate towards things like home economics. And you can see right here in the center lies my beloved social sciences, you know, closer to the infinite discontinuity of intelligence side of the brainlet scale rather than the galaxy brain mathematicians over there. But this is, again, likely because people who score lower recognize their own strengths and weaknesses. And having to take a look at your SAT score forces us to look at exactly where we are in terms of our capacity for academic excellence. Don't get me wrong, the SAT is in no way a determinant. Even at our best with the SAT, we're talking about 50% of variance explained. That means the other half is explained by other stuff. But you should know your limits. If you tried your hardest and you got a cumulative 800 on the SAT, you know, you do you, boo, but I'm not going to recommend you go into theoretical mathematics. I wasn't this close to achieving your greatness, Albert. And now, I am just average. Average! And this is reflected in the data, that again illustrates the effect of SAT on course choice, as those who scored higher on the SAT tended to be more likely to take advanced courses, and that the SAT was about as good at predicting students would take more complex courses to the same degree as high school GPA. But wait a minute, Aiden. Grades aren't everything, right? We all kind of know that. After all, some college courses and majors are just more difficult, and as we've looked at, people who tend to score high on the SAT tend to take more difficult courses, and people who score lower tend to, uh, enroll in critical cultural basket weaving. It's just common sense, right? But this isn't a common sense channel, this is a common spectrum channel. So is it true that the humanities earn higher grades than STEM fields? The answer might surprise you. Just kidding. <laughs> Sabat and Wakeman Lin, 1991, found that 25% of English majors ended up earning an average above a B-, while only 15% of economy majors did. Further, Shaw et al. 2011, a little bit more recently, indicated that the SAT was a far better predictor of GPAs in the hard sciences, being less powerful at predicting cumulative grades, precisely because the SAT underpredicts grades in the soft sciences where almost everyone earns an A. So let's avoid looking exclusively at grades, at least just yet, and look at what else the SAT potentially predicts. So let's tap some mana and scry into life outcomes outside of just a number or letter grade. Still within the university system at the graduate level, when a student has now become the teacher and is often expected not only to work for the university but also to publish research, various standardized tests have some pretty strong correlations with graduate level success outside of merely GPA, as found by Kunzel and Heslet 2007. For example, a high score on the MCAT, the Medical College Admissions Test, was positively strongly correlated with obtaining medical licenses. I would sure hope so. I'd be terrified if the correlation wasn't that strong. <laughs> they asked me how well I understood theoretical physics. I said I had a theoretical degree in physics. They said, welcome aboard. Additionally, though, the GRE was moderately to slightly correlated with degree completion, research production, and citations for graduate students. While some of these correlations are pretty puny, it still indicates that standardized tests have correlations outside of just mere grades. The Miller Analogies Test, a test used to determine graduate school admissions, and until recently, the greatest possible life achievement for the truly euphoric Mensa membership which measures specific knowledge about the relationship between vocabulary rather than general reasoning questions, and was found across a meta-analysis from Kunzel, Huslet, and Onus 2004 to be positively correlated with greater general job performance and performance in specific careers, namely counseling and academic administration. So scoring well on something like the SAT might indicate that you might be a little bit better at your job in the future, regardless of what job that is. Again, not a determinant. 
just a prediction. But even more interestingly, Lubinsky 2009 found that the SAT is actually quite capable of predicting success over a very long period of time, with significant variance even seen across the top 1% of scorers when the test was administered at age 13. Those with a higher SAT score, even across these tippity top test takers, were considerably more likely to have earned a doctoral degree, published research, or any kind of literature, or have obtained a patent 25 years or later after taking the SAT. And the higher your score, even in the top 1%, the more likely all of those outcomes. Well then damn, it seems that the SAT and other standardized tests are pretty good at predicting what they're supposed to predict, and then some. But if they're so good at predicting something as complicated as college success, when we think about all of the individual life variables that go into that, why then is it consistently that there seems to be such a widespread disparity in SAT scores across ethnic, racial, and socioeconomic groups? Now I know what you're thinking. And we'll get to that. But first I have to address the problem of poverty. Obviously, the impoverished have access to fewer resources than the affluent. And a large rationale behind the adversity index that's been proposed by College Board is that socioeconomic status overwhelmingly influences SAT scores. But does it? And if it does, to what degree? So let's look at socioeconomic status and its effect on SAT scores, as well as GPA in general. A long-standing criticism of the SAT, both from academics, journalists, pundits alike, is that it does not measure academic success. It only measures how rich someone is. As richer students do tend to have access to things like private tutors, they tend to have more free time, not spent babysitting siblings or having to work a part-time job, and they have access to all the best prep money can buy. Joss Sumrun of the Wall Street Journal said of the SAT that it was not a student aptitude test, but rather a student affluence test. A look at a 2014 report from the Washington Post should make that overwhelmingly clear. As parental income increases, so does SAT scores. Well, question answered. Except even as the Washington Post writer seemingly regretfully admits, income is not a determinant, as for every spurgy kid from a first-generation Asian family who pours all of his resources and passion into achieving his lifelong dream of building and piloting his own combat mech, there is a spoiled, lazy thought who doesn't need a college degree to be an Instagram model. I just don't see why everyone's always picking on Marie Antoinette. I can so relate to her. She worked really hard to look that good, and people just don't appreciate that kind of effort. Again, we all kind of know that, but I'm the kind of Fed who refuses to allow what seems to be so self-evident to go without empirical evidence. So yes, as always, there's research on that. As Kunsel, McNeil, and Sackett report that the absolute smallest variance across SES brackets for the SAT was 94%. There is about as much variation within SES brackets as there is between SES brackets. There is plenty of difference between students of the same socioeconomic status. But just how does SES affect SAT scores now that we know what the SAT predicts? Is there any validity to the claim of College Board that controlling for adversity would somehow make the SAT more valid and fair? A ton of research, and I mean, I guess if I printed it all out, it, it probably wouldn't be a ton unless I had it like engraved on stone tablets or something, but a lot of research has been done to see if there's any merit to these kinds of claims. And in overview, Sackett and Kunsel 2018, across multiple, multiple studies, meta-analyses, and hundreds of thousands of students. When they accounted for SES, the SAT maintained an average of over 90% of its predictive power towards college GPA. In other words, oh, it's over nine. even when the scientists anticipated that socioeconomic status would result in lower SAT scores, the SAT remained a strong predictive force in anticipating academic outcomes. This was even the case in California specifically after they implemented different versions of the tests that were specifically designed to reduce SES differences, as seen in Saka et al. 2012. Despite claims from journalists that the SAT is just measuring SES, we can clearly and easily see this is not the case when you can account for the same amount of variance, more or less, by simply putting SES into the model. The problem isn't that the SAT loses its predictive ability, it's that it's too good at predicting. And the prediction isn't a positive one. People who come from low SES backgrounds tend to score lower on the SAT, and when they score lower on the SAT, they're more likely to get lower grades in college. The problem that College Board has with its own instrument is not that it's a bad instrument, but that it points out these kinds of disparities. And those disparities just aren't politically correct. Yes, it's undeniable that people of lower SES status do tend to do more poorly on the test, but that doesn't make the test a poor one when we can so easily account for it. But hang on for a second. 
The SAT includes reasoning questions, sure, but a lot of the test is based on memorization of mathematic formulas, vocabulary, social science, history, and so on, which is precisely why the SAT is not an IQ test. An IQ test measures concepts related to memory, problem solving, analytical reasoning, spatial recognition, all in culmination of G. That means that the SAT is a test you can practice for, at least to a degree unlike an IQ test. So when it comes to socioeconomic status, despite the fact that we've seen that it maintains its predictive capacity, is it possible that the consistently higher scores we see across higher SES students then, which again is undeniable, is not a result of SES inherently, but rather the potential for access to advanced prep programs and tutoring that are only an option for the upper garlic parmesan crust? Daddy, I withdrew from Bel Air Academy six weeks ago and transferred to Morris High. <laughs> And that's not an unreasonable assumption. I mean, have you looked at how expensive it is to take an SAT prep course? Just looking here at Kaplan alone, one of the largest SAT prep programs in the country, and a course I was personally lucky enough to be able to take, and I say lucky because if you believe the reports from companies like Kaplan, they can easily boost your SAT score by 100 to 200 points. That's a lot of damage. But these programs begin at $900 and can easily soar into the thousands for private tutors. In other words, if these expensive programs can really boost your SAT score, score by 200 points, well, that's big if true. But are the assertions of Kaplan and the like accurate? Well, nope. as was demonstrated by Powers and Rock 1999, they found that yes, taking an SAT prep course did report gains in SAT scores. However, these effects were negligible when in comparison to students who just similarly took a pretest in preparation. Specifically, students who participated in one of these pricey programs saw an increase of an average of 29 points on the verbal and 40 points in the math while those who merely took a practice test saw an increase in verbal and mathematics of 21 and 22 points respectively. About double gains in the math, but you can take those tests for free online. Lots of schools give them out for free. And either way, these small improvements are nowhere near the high numbers that are touted by these prep giants. This becomes even further compounded when considering that these data also indicate that those who attended coached SAT prep courses were also more likely to have used other study aids, books, software, or had previously taken the test. In other words, students who used one method of studying were likely to use multiple methods. Thus, it's not necessarily the most rich exclusively who benefit from tutoring, but rather those who seek out tutoring also tend to be people who use multiple methods of study and preparation. The smart kids are trying to prepare themselves. Attention! All honor students will be rewarded with a trip to an archaeological dig. Yay! Conversely, all detention students will be punished with a trip to an archaeological dig. Oh, no. If the only thing Stacy knows about Tan is a booth, then I highly doubt pouring thousands of dollars into something like Kaplan's gonna secure that high SAT score. This may explain this wide variance that we see across SES as it concerns SAT scores, individual student motivation, and individual student intelligence. At this point then, you also might be thinking, okay Aiden, I get it. The SAT is a pretty good instrument at determining GPA in college, but you already pointed out that college GPAs are not the same across majors. And you're right, grades are often highly subjective when we consider that some majors are just easier than others. Like, I'm not throwing any shade, because for all of my obsession with statistics, I certainly don't have the lobes to be a theoretical mathematician either, hence why I'm quite comfortable with my hamster wheel brain and its simplistic love of pretty numbers. Nice and comfy, in the center of the cognitive twilight zone of complete academic mediocrity. <sighs> anyway, while we've seen that high school GPA and SAT tend to predict college GPA, since there are so many criticisms of the SAT and the racial disparities that it forwards, as well as the SES disparities, which we covered, but we have also seen consistently that undergraduate GPA has been used in addition to SAT scores to determine academic admissions. So is there a good reason to believe that maybe GPA is a better method for universities to utilize in determining who they accept, and is it better at predicting collegiate academic success? Let's look at GPA and the problems of GPA inflation. If the SAT is potentially biased when it comes to SES and race, on the, on the SES side, again, we've seen it's not. But hey, let's pretend to be stupid. Wait, is this one of those tests where if I believe you, then I'm retarded? No, you're retarded. Because the sheer fact is, yes, people of higher SES status tend to score higher on the SAT on average. So, can we look to GPA as a good alternative predictive measurement for college success? I would argue, probably not. Actually, 
Definitely not, at least not anymore, precisely because grade point average has become increasingly inflated over time. And if all high schoolers are getting increasingly higher and higher grades, that majorly brings into question the validity of using high school grades as a key decision-making tool for college enrollment. Specifically, Zymek and Svek, 1995, assessed the inflation of high school grades between 1989 and 1994, and they found a steady increase in the number of A grades received during the time. Interestingly, they found a downturn in general SAT scores that appeared in tandem with the overall increase in the number of A grades. That is, as grades in school went up, scores on the SAT went down, potentially because students felt less of a need to overly prep for one measurement of college acceptance when they already have a 4.0 grade point average. A more recent review from the Fordham Institute in 2018 reports that since 2006 up to 2016, high school GPA has remained on a steady incline. But note that this GPA increase, while universal, resulted in the highest GPAs in private and affluent high schools. More importantly, this is related to some pretty serious outcomes, as they report that many of these students, one-third in fact, who received at least a B in class, failed to pass their end-of-course exams. It's almost like when you give out A's for free, no one's gonna work for them. Why the frig everything gotta take effort? Sounds doable. And this assignment? Pass Passable, so passable, and passable assures my graduation. So we are doing doable and passable. Moreover, Hurwitz and Lee 2018 reported an overall increase in GPA from 3.27 in 1998 to 3.38 in 2016. And similarly, they found that as grades increased, SAT scores decreased. Specifically, A's now constitute 47% of all high school grades. The point of the grading scale, tell me if I'm wrong, is for it to be a standard bell curve, with C being the average, the mean of all students. But with the implementation of programs like No Child Left Behind, this curve was skewed, and it is continually being further and further skewed towards an average of an A. And here's the kicker, the effect of this can be seen most evidently in GPA increase occurring the slowest in schools, where people tend to score also the lowest on SATs. Low low SES schools. But what this all means is that essentially when it comes to college applications, half of the students have a nearly identical and pristine GPA, and the other half just don't. How can GPA now possibly be a better predictor than SAT if 50% of the GPA of students is nearly identical? This total growth in GPA for the purpose of equalizing school outcomes such as the case of No Child Left Behind actually had a significant divergent effect on those in the most impoverished schools, tending to see the slowest increase in overall GPA and a subsequent similar decline in SAT scores. In other words, attempts to get more low SES students from disadvantaged backgrounds into colleges actually resulted in a new dualistic system where half of the students have indistinguishable yet impeccable grades and the other half has anything less. Obviously, colleges want to prioritize the former. As their SAT scores go up, the GPA goes up, and the disparities between SES and race in meeting the rising criteria for admittance into college therefore becomes increasingly obvious and impossible for colleges to ignore. At least for the sensitive, liberal-minded college administrators, the college board, and all the academics out there witnessing this phenomena in terror. Because deep down, they know what's going on. Even Dr. James Flynn, who has been a long-term proponent of emphasizing environmental research over genetic research in the study of IQ and race differences. Writes in his book, Are We Getting Smarter?, that this is an ongoing trend of academics seemingly intentionally wanting to avoid these uncomfortable questions. He states, They fund the most mundane research projects but never seem to have funds to test for genetic differences between races. I tell US academics I can only assume that they believe that racial IQ differences have a genetic component and fear what they might find. They never admit that the politics of race affects their research priorities. It's always just far more important to establish whether squirrels enjoy the magic flute. Unfortunately, there's no field of medicine that deals with the brain. But I can give you a pamphlet for a cult. And when you don't have any research to go on, or when you ignore the research that does exist, you end up implementing programs that don't make any sense, like artificial GPA inflation, for the purpose of leaving no child behind. But raising high school GPAs does not raise the SAT, which is not going to predict any more potential in college. Which is precisely why we actually see a growing disparity, at least in the ACT, with scores across racial and SES becoming wider. As a 2017 reports that only 9% of low SES students from families who lacked degrees of Black, Latino, or Native heritage were ready for college upon graduation from high school, meeting ACT benchmarks. 
The even wider problem of high school GPA inflation is that it has transferred into the university system. A massive analysis of college GPA inflation from Rochstauser and Healy 2012 looked at GPA trends between 1940 and 2009, and similarly found that A's have become the most common grade received, comprising 43% of all grades received in college, a near mirror image to the 47% we see in high school. As shown here, we can see the skewing of the average grade from about a C plus or a B minus in the 1960s to a B plus or an A over time. The once extraordinary A has become ordinary as we enter the age of A for effort, not just at the high school level, but at the college level as well. If high school teachers were incentivized to raise students' grades via the US government, and why then were college teachers? The obvious answer is that, well, if you've never seen a C before and you waltz out of your easy A remedial geometry course into linear algebra, you might be stunned at your failing grade and subsequently be prone to blame not yourself, but the teacher for your failing. After all, you've always been a straight-A student. A passing grade? Like a C? Why don't I just get pregnant at a bus station? This was tested actually by Lang B in 2005, who looked at students' ratings of teachers and how close their expected grades were to the grade they actually received in a class. He found that when teachers gave higher grades that were closest to the student expectations that they were accounting for for their grades, that over 98% of variance was accounted for in teacher evaluations. When they accounted for fixed effects, and that is, as we've talked about, some courses are simply harder or easier than others, matching students' own expectations, their own high expectations for grades, accounted for 99.5% of the variance in positive teacher evaluations. That our square value is the most beautiful thing I've ever laid eyes on. Yet it's also sad. Because of the implication. Because here's what this means. College professors are themselves graded by universities for which they work in order to obtain pay raises and ultimately the cushy position of tenure. Part of these evaluations involves things like research production and publication, but a large chunk of it is based on student evaluations of your teaching. Out of fear of getting a bad rating from a student to whom the C is foreign, incentivizes college teachers looking for that tasty tenure to turn their attention away from actual performance into themselves performing a farce of a program and handing out A's like it's Mardi Gras beads. Show me them positive evaluations, girl. And say no, goodbye no, 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 no. to these, because it's the last time. Interestingly, this has not affected all of academe identically, although similarly. As we can see in Sabat Wakeman Lin, 1991, who assessed the proportions of grades across students from a small private university between 1962 and 1986, they found that particularly across the soft sciences and humanities, grades were on a very steady increase during that time, with the average grade in the early 60s being a C, but having moved to a solid B by the mid-1980s. They also reported that students who took a course in economics, for example, which at the time was the most rigorous in its grading practices, and received a B in that course, were 18% less likely to take another econ class, and were 28% less likely to take another econ class if they had received a C. The effects were similar but slightly weaker for English courses, with English being the most lenient program in terms of grades, such that students who received a B or a C in English were 14 or 20% respectively less likely to take another English course. But given that Bs are so rare in English, this means that students are actually actively incentivized to take more English courses and disincentivized to take econ courses. The result is that more people take English classes and humanities classes and the overall GPA of the university is inflated. As further evidence of the effect of inflated high school GPAs on the anticipated college GPA is illustrated in Eisler 2002, who found that as high school GPA rose, so did college students expectations of receiving an A on any given course. Moreover, this tendency towards the A likely disincentivized students to actually learn or work for anything in their courses. Why would you work when you know you have the power to essentially bully your professor into giving you an A anyway? And again, this probably overwhelmingly affects STEM, as research from RAS 2010 illustrates that students were far more likely to take an additional STEM course and ultimately major in a STEM field when they had received higher grades in these courses. Thus, the same trend infects not just the arts and humanities, but ultimately does start to affect the scientific fields in that if these fields want to keep their students, they have to give them higher grades. And if the A is so easy, why work for it?
there's some evidence that the implementation of plus minus scoring in college courses may incentivize some students to work a little harder, particularly in more complicated fields, as Manaya 2017 found that implementation of a plus minus grade score increased the number of A's earned in both STEM majors and the humanities, but particularly within STEM. It gave the nerds something to work for. I did all your assignments. All you have to do is sign your name. Chocolate means nothing to me. But in contrast, McClure and Spectre 2005 found that offering plus minus grading resulted in absolutely no increase in students' incentives to work harder. If the average is already an A, and all that matters is what that A turns into, the number, my GPA, the extra little gold star for good effort isn't enough of a reason for a lot of students to probably work harder or actually learn anything. This means that graduating from college at this point with honors, much as graduating with a high GPA from high school or graduating from college at all, is simply no longer as difficult as it once was. And the effects of this trend are evident not just inside, but outside of the ivory tower. For example, looking at terminal and graduate degrees from Wang Sorobat 2008, law schools have become increasingly skeptical of undergraduate GPAs as a good predictor for law school admittance, as GPA has become increasingly less correlated with the LSAT, the Law School Admissions Test, particularly in the top 95 percentile of applicants. This applies to other fields as well. The LSAT is just a better predictor than GPA, which is as inflated as we know it is. This applies far outside of the academy, though, as well, as a career builder survey from 2016 illustrates that 27% of employers now require a graduate degree for employees, and another 37% now require an undergraduate degree for positions which previously only required a high school diploma. It is obvious that grades and even diplomas have been systematically devalued. They no longer mean what they once did, and employers are seeking a bastion in the graduate degrees, which are suffering from the same transfer of grade inflation that we see in high schools and in undergraduate degrees. These degrees are not worth the paper they are printed on, particularly not when we rely on the rising high school GPA as a manner of determining who should go to which school. With all of that in mind, the SAT and other standardized tests are quickly becoming evident to anyone paying attention are the only empirical way to reasonably come up with a good idea of who should or should not go to a certain college. But we can't use it because it's racist, right? That's kind of what we hear. We need this adversity index, that'll fix it. So we need to touch on the other major disparity that the adversity score is intended to mitigate. And that is that Black, Latino, and Native Americans tend to score on average 200 to 400 points lower than white and Asian students, according to a 2018 SAT report, which also finds that women tend to perform slightly less competently than men, particularly in math. Thus, to my chagrin, we need to touch on the elephants in the room, race, sex, and the SAT. Look, the evidence is there. Outside of Asians, the majority of minority groups in the United States tend to perform more poorly on the SAT than do whites. We need to see then if the instrument really is biased and how it intersects with college achievement. Is this instrument intentionally somehow designed to discriminate against minority groups? So let's break this down. First of all, the fear regarding using the SAT to predict college performance is precisely because it does seem to be biased against Black, Hispanic, and Native American students. However, Mattern and Patterson 2013 found that the SAT actually over-predicts college GPA of minority groups. That is, they tended to perform worse in terms of grades in college than the SAT would typically predict for someone who scored the same on the instrument. In contrast, the SAT tends to underpredict women's GPA scores, in that women tend to receive higher grades in college than their pure SAT score would typically indicate. This all means that the SAT actually overpredicts Black and Latino and Native American performance, in that it's almost too good at predicting what it's meant to predict, and those students don't usually meet the criteria that it anticipates. Dissipates. And ultimately, that does give some good credence to the concept that the SAT is not a great predictor when it comes to minority groups, at least not as much as it is for Asians and white people. But the problem is what this all means is probably not what those arguing for an adversity index would like for it to mean, as accounting for the disparity in the SAT because of this finding would actually only magnify that disparity between SAT scores across minority groups and college GPA, even as GPA itself skyrockets. Let me explain. The SAT already overpredicts Black and Latino GPA in college. If we give them higher SAT scores, it will become a less predictive instrument because it will inflate a score that already overpredicts GPA. This actively will make the SAT less predictive in its capacity. 
And remind me again who exactly that's good for. Oh, like the minority students that you accept who then can't compete at a university level where it's just outside of their skill capacity? And it doesn't have to be minority, it could be low SES, it could be anybody, it could be a, a rich thought, it doesn't matter. Some of you may discover a wonderful vocation you never even imagined. Others may find out life isn't fair. In spite of your masters from Bryn Mawr, you might end up a glorified babysitter to a bunch of dead-eyed fourth graders while your husband runs naked on a beach with your marriage counselor. This is the purpose of the SAT score, to make sure that the student matches up with the university. And you've actually found one aspect of the SAT that over-predicts performance, and you want to screw that one up? Yeah, not a good idea. Look, you don't have to be a mathematician to figure this one out. It's some real basic shit. But again, grades aren't everything. So what about race, major, and the SAT? As we've seen, the SAT can predict majors. In terms of how the SAT intersects with race and major choice, Dixon 2010 found that Hispanic, Black, and many other minority men in particular were significantly more likely than other groups to attend college with an undecided major, which itself was strongly negatively related to higher SAT scores. That means in general, for more minority status men rather than women, they're probably taking a lot of pretty easy general ed courses. And that actually only exacerbates the predicament of the overprediction of GPA for minority groups in general, at least outside of Asians, in that we found the SAT overpredicts minority GPA in college, and we also find that at least among minority group males, they tend to take easy A courses. That means they are way, way underperforming based on the predictions of the SAT. And in that case, yes, I do have to say, the SAT is not a good score at predicting collegiate outcomes for minority male groups. But that's not the case for women. Although there is a similar disconnect between SAT scores and college performance, as women do tend to earn higher GPAs in college than males with the same SAT scores. But Kunsel and all 2016 found that this was likely because women chose easier subjects and majors. In contrast to males of minority background, this actually inflates women's college GPA. And it's interesting to note that those with the highest trait conscientiousness, that's a trait typically pretty common in women, actually accounted for most of the difference in predicted GPA by the SAT when they put conscientiousness into the mix. It ended up producing a GPA for women that was normalized by their SAT score when you accounted for their increased conscientiousness. Playing by the rules gets you better grades. Wow, what a shocker. And women are a little bit less likely to rock the boat, at least socially. Not to worry. I have a permit. This just says I can do what I want. So when you take that into account, their predicted GPA pretty much matched their actual GPA as predicted by the SAT. But the real question is, since we see these differences in predictive capacity of the SAT on minorities and women, as well as the general lower SAT scores of these groups and across lower SES groups, is there a really good rationale to stop using the SAT, even with what we know about GPA inflation and its predictive power? Would removing standardized tests lead to more minority students being admitted to universities? I'm sure you'll also be shocked to learn that yes, yes it does. What a twist! As found by Epp and Shade and Chung 2012, that when they ran a simulation on the likelihood of admission, they found that if universities made standardized tests optional or implemented a don't ask, don't tell approach to these tests, admitted more black and Hispanic participants, as well as lower SES status students and fewer white and Asian students, as well as those from an upper middle class background. And we've kind of seen that happen. Colleges have frequently come under fire recently for reducing the acceptance of Asian students because, as with whites, well, they tend to perform a little bit better on standardized tests. Thus to say that the removal of these tests would help minorities and people of lower SES is inaccurate, as, hey, Asians are a minority in the US, and they're less likely to be admitted when there's no longer an empirical measure that's actually being utilized to determine admissions. And schools sure are seeing this kind of increase as more and more of them adopt opt-in test policies, which over a thousand schools in the United States have now begun utilizing. Interesting, introducing these opt-in strategies had almost no effect on the upper class because, as we've seen, you can just buy your way into college with enough money. Journey, come with me. Daddy bought you some encyclopedias so you can get smarter. You won't be stupid like Daddy when you get older. But here's the problem. When you remove this one empirical measure that's related to academic success pretty consistently, what are colleges left with to make their decisions? We've seen that GPA has become highly spurious and maybe not so reliable. Well, then all colleges really have are demographic data, perhaps a college admittance essay, maybe a placement test, although I'm sure those are also quickly becoming a thing of the past as well. So what do we do? Dr. Charles Murray, in a chapter from 2011, has also made a case for the abolishment of the SAT, but not for the purpose of diversity and inclusion for its own sake, but rather because he objects to the criterion and curriculum-based nature of the modern versions of the SAT, which measure acquired knowledge rather than that thing, the G-factor. 
and that the move away from measuring intelligence was precisely due to fear from College Board that they would have to report persistent differences across groups as a function of genetic variance across races and the G-factor. He suggested they intentionally restructured the test to involve memorization of vocabularies, such that now excelling at the SAT becomes more of a matter of memory than mere reasoning. A massive study of applicants at UC Berkeley between 1996 and 1999 illustrates this, as some of these early changes towards the more memorization-based version of the SAT were implemented slightly before the study was conducted, from Geisner and Studley, 2004, who assessed the importance of GPA achievement tests and the SAT with college freshman GPA. And they found that when measured alone, and even when added to the model in addition to GPA, with scores from the SAT 2, which is subject matter tests, the SAT itself added virtually no additional predictive information. GPA and subject matter tests were better at predicting college success. How could that be when we've seen that the SAT has also shown to be such a predictive powerhouse in other studies? Well, a lot of that might be because of the more recent increases in both high school and college GPA, in that GPA has lost its own predictive ability and capacity over time, which makes a lot of sense on its face, right? Dr. Murray's rationale for requesting the current SAT be abolished is because it has become a measure of memorization, not a measure of G. But due to social pressures, knowing that the racial disparities will be even more evident in tests that more accurately measure G if we look at the disparities between race and IQ across general population trends, it's not a determinant. While such admissions tests would probably have greater predictive ability, at the same time, it is impossible for university administrators to admit to such a racial, ethnic, and SES disparity, let alone one that would potentially be made even greater when we know we can account for SES differences. Unfortunately, it would mean that college admissions would have to admit that there are genetic predispositions that we all have. And that's just not okay, man. What happens if you say that and someone gets offended? Well, they can be offended. Remember how little effect tutoring actually had on SAT scores while SES seems to have had a much larger effect? Well, Murray contends this is because higher IQ people tend to have higher degrees and subsequently make more money and produce higher IQ children. That is, it's important to look at the highest education completed by parents rather than just SES alone, as these variables are all interrelated. If you're smarter, you probably make more money. And a 2006 report from the College Board indicates that half of the students who scored a 700 or above on the SAT came from families that made over $100,000 a year. But of those, 90% had a parent with at least one college degree and 50% had at least one parent with a graduate degree. The differences in SES and race and their interconnection are largely genetic. And this is reflected in modern SAT data from 2018, which indicates that students whose parents had a bachelor or graduate degree scored between 100 and 200 points higher on average than children of parents with a high school diploma. Like it or not, there is clearly a genetic component, the G factor that we can all argue all day and night about what degree precisely genetics play in determining G and what precise degree environment does, or at what stage that malnutrition potentially supersedes genetic predisposition. But to contend that evolution stopped at the neck is not scientifically honest, and as such, it does affect SAT scores, even as the instrument has become increasingly based on memory. Parental education achievement has been similarly found by Dixon, Roman, Everson, and McArdle, 2013, to account for differences in SAT scores. However, it is important to note that the effects of poverty on achievement were more than double in black students, and even students from high-earning black families consistently scored lower on the SAT, the genetic factors of parental education on the SAT, even designed as it is now based more on mnemonics than reasoning, indicates a disproportionate effect of SES only as it applies to the black population. Murray then asks us to end using the SAT, not because it's a bad instrument, but because it doesn't measure G, and instead is designed to sync up with high school curriculum to bolster the scores of everybody by replacing intelligence with memorization. This is why practice works just as well as any other tutoring in regards to the SAT. Yet even under the system, we still see these racial differences. And given the political climate, I cannot see a test of G ever being used in college admissions in the far foreseeable future. Even the SAT is under criticism for showing any disparity. And it's just another attempt to erase these differences, which is not something shameful, it's just reality. And it's not a determinant. How much cooler is it to be given this kind of hand in life and say, no you? The physical and mental hardships faced by the students are meant to build character and strength. It gives you a good idea of maybe where your strengths and weaknesses are, but it's not telling you what to do. 
And if the end result is that everyone gets an A for effort, what exactly is the point of college if everyone passes and everyone succeeds if they put in any effort? Because we cannot allow a strong predictive instrument to exist when it finds differences across race, ethnicity, and SES. But the SAT is not alone, so if it produces these disparate responses across races, are there any alternative tests that would create a more standardized curve across all races and SES groups? Several alternatives to the SAT have been proposed to mitigate the differences we find across race, gender, and SES. However, most of them have failed to live up to their high expectations. For example, Sedlicek, 2004, designed a non-cognitive instrument intended for use in college admissions to move away from those pesky differences between race and SES when you use more cognitive measures, you know, things that relate more closely to, to G, that naughty IQ thing. His instrument includes items instead related to positive self-concept, common sense knowledge, community service, and understanding the social effects of racism. Well, there's no agenda here, folks, now is there? So place your bets right now on just how predictive Dr. Silicek's instrument was in predicting college GPA. Was it a little or was it a lot? How much stock footage is in this, is in this movie? Is it a little bit or a lot? <laughs> well, surprise, you're both wrong because the answer is zero. <laughs> As found by Thomas Kunzel and C. 2007 in a meta-analysis of the instrument. They found that this non-cognitive measurement had a next to zero degree relationship with college GPA outcomes. And while black students did tend to perform better on some parts of the instrument, they performed worse than whites on others. Either way, the entire thing is pointless because Thomas and Pals decimated the very concept of Sedlicek's non-cognitive instrument, and despite being thoroughly dabbed on, Sedlicek has continued to tout his instrument such to the point that it was included in the 2010 International Encyclopedia of Education, all while Thomas et al.'s data remained T-posing over its corpse like the freaking end of Evangelion. There was no relationship, but that's not the only failed attempt at coming up with another measure to replace the SAT's predictive ability while reducing racial and SES disparity. There is also the very well-intentioned Rainbow Project from Sternberg and his colleagues 2006. They also included common sense as well as creativity and storytelling and being able to read comics into their instrument in an attempt to account for divergent life experiences and include unique methods of learning that they hoped would result in a more even testing environment, where everyone scored closer to the mean. While yes, African American participants performed better on some measures of the test, they performed far worse than whites on others, including common sense. Asians performed worse in almost all of the creative measures than they did on the traditional SAT measures, and Native Americans, interestingly, also struggled with some of those creative measures as well. In a way, the Rainbow Project actually produced a rainbow of different skill sets, talents, and proclivities between races and not across them, rather than generating the homogenous tendency towards the mean that the researchers were hoping for. It actually did display a rainbow, much to the chagrin I would surmise of the dedicated scientists who worked on this project to try and get it to reduce differences across race and actually produced a more quote-unquote racist test. And there are more attempts that I could go over, but let's be real. This hasn't been a very fruitful area of research. And by now breaking the SAT, you are breaking one of the instruments that actually does serve its function. So in summation of this short segment of this long video, and to paraphrase Winston Churchill, the SAT is the worst system of predicting college, academic, and occupational success that we have, except for all of the others. And thus, with everything we've learned about the SAT, college GPAs and high school GPAs, social economic status, race, sex, and the idea of an adversity index, let's come to some conclusions. I think we can all agree, based on what we've looked at, that the SAT is a solid instrument, and when combined with GPA in particular, it explains usually about half of variance in college GPA scores. Significant evidence that the SAT is correlated with many outcome variables, including but no way limited to academic success. Ultimately, the point of an admissions test is as much for the benefit of the school as for the student. Ideally, schools attempt to match up with students who will reflect well upon the school, and then when it comes to school rankings, 
having a higher graduation rate, having higher GPAs, and so on makes the school look better. And students benefit from attending an institution that accommodates them academically and often financially. Because of this, schools are incentivized to give out scholarships to particularly high-achieving students. Particularly noteworthy graduates paint a positive image for an even larger potential student pool. As particularly in graduate and doctoral work, the scientists that have graduated from a program have their names permanently associated with it. And the greater prestige garnered from having a wider retinue of prominent scholars again increases the value of the university in obtaining grants and in research funding. It is in the best interest of both parties to attract the best students and to accept the best students, and those most capable of completing a four-year degree or higher. Yet how can we determine which students are a good fit if seemingly every test being utilized to calculate this fit has been made essentially meaningless? Beginning with the artificial inflation of grades in high schools over the last half of a century, GPA has become increasingly a less reliable source for determining a student's actual academic potential, and finding courses and programs that accommodate to meet that potential. Standardized tests, given their strong correlation to academic outcomes even without including GPA into the mix, therefore have become a better way of allowing schools to determine fit, because as high school GPA rose, so did college GPA. And it's not hard to see why when we consider university-level pedagogy. Mismatched students to a university where they may not have the capacity to excel, yet are used to getting easy A's in high school, are understandably frustrated that now they are finding themselves getting D's and F's. So guess what? They don't get D's or F's. But if they did, they would rate their instructors poorly, due to this perceived incongruity. In response, teachers seeking tenure and pay raises also begin to move the mean away from C, where it should belong in a normal curve, skewed towards the A. As a result, the same infection was spread to law school, medical school, and other advanced educational programs. The GPA, across all academic institutions, has become functionally meaningless, and it continues to inflate at one level into another. Down the line, the disease spreads. Yet despite this, SAT and other instruments remain good predictors of success even without GPA. Yet are we to implement what the College Board intends to do by adding this diversity or adversity ranking to the SAT, which will normalize all participants towards a mean, it will become a useless instrument because it will be impossible to differentiate between subjects. Does this person have a higher score because they are generally more adept at academics or because they come from a poor neighborhood? When we have accounted for SES and the SAT, it is still a strong predictor. 90% of the half of the variance that is accounted for by SAT was still accounted for when we took socioeconomic status into consideration. The problem with normalizing the curve is that it becomes that there's no clear way to determine the origin of the score as internal or external. This would mean both more excellent students being excluded from prestigious institutions and missing out on scholarships, and more poor students being accepted into schools that they would struggle to compete at academically. This is not good for anybody. This doesn't make any sense. Well, sure it does, see? Oh no, this doesn't make any sense. And we've seen this happen across both fields, as professors fear the power of student feedback on their careers and become increasingly pressured to hand out A's. This means more students graduating, but many having gained little to no knowledge or skills, but much in the way of student loans. The result is universities have stopped producing as many truly academically excellent students that reflect well back upon the institution, but instead have become degree mills that are desperate to keep up appearances. If, and it's not an if, it's a when, this diversity index is incorporated into the SAT, which it will be. Since GPA is increasingly pointless, so now too will be the SAT meaning the only real criteria left to judge students by is the peripherals, the college essays, the extracurriculars, and so on. Some schools also utilize entrance exams still to place students, but they're typically criterion and knowledge-based rather than raw intelligence, and that's obviously insensitive and bigoted, and it's again why more than a thousand schools have made their entrance exams optional, all the while segregating their orientations programs and their graduation programs, all in the name of diversity. Let students choose their own placement. That'll work out fine, I'm sure. Look, when I took my individual college's placement exam, I was so god-awful at the math section that I was placed into a class titled, and I'm not joking with you, Math and the Creative Imagination. And the teacher was just as patient as one need be for that level of specialness. Then, a year later, I took a course on stats, and well, look at where we are now. I like science. The point is, I needed that special ed course because I was really behind at math at the time, and my school helped me catch up. 
my school cared and realized that I needed a good teacher to please be patient and pay closer attention in that area when I struggled with math. Math, the subject that I now sit around thinking about all the time. That's the power of X, baby. And a Midwestern Catholic education. I should get to spend eternity in a medium place, like Cincinnati. Everyone who wasn't perfect but wasn't terrible should get to spend eternity in Cincinnati. The point is, there is nothing left to judge students by. There's no way to determine which students wouldn't fit in best at which school or in which program and what course. It's now just a complete randomized crapshoot. As such, teachers acclimate. They give better grades to secure that tasty tenure, so they pass out A's like candy in the humanities. And the kids over in STEM, well, they want candy too. So those STEM professors, they follow suit. Everyone graduates, the school's rating goes up, but the number of people with degrees that are about as useful as to wipe one's own arse, then succeed in a type of career, and with no skills, just skyrockets. And yet they still anticipate their degree holds value, because at one point it did. But we've seen increasingly that more and more employers require their employees to have advanced degrees because businesses certainly have started to realize ages ago now that the bachelor's degree means very little when GPA is so inflated. Unfortunately, as we've seen, this cancer has spread to the terminal degrees as well. With the implementation of this diversity index, the last bastion of empirical assessment in college admissions has essentially become moot. From now on, it's a simple roll of the dice and hope you're not white. Why this is so upsetting to me is because I've explained many times that I love the concept of academia, of stuffy old nerds like Plato and Aristotle sitting around debating philosophy or scientists obsessively researching completing a complex formulae, but that's not the state of academia. I personally idolize the classical concept of the ivory tower as a world apart from whence we can dissect all observable and non-observable aspects of the universe around us, but it has become a world apart and not the one that I idolize in my weird academic fantasies wherein academe is separate not due to the necessity of separation for objectivity, but a necessity of subjectivity to maintain the constant flow of coin to the coffers. This even as someone who loves the tower as a concept. I think it's time we let it crumble, and I've said that before. My best advice to young people considering going to college is one word. Don't. Your hard work and dedication will be nigh useless unless you have a very specific advanced and terminal degree in mind. Not even STEM is safe, and for a fraction of the money that you would likely spend taking out in student loans, selling your soul to the federal government for the next 10 to 20 years, you could start your own business or get certification training in something like HVAC or technology field. You too, my friend, can learn to code. Your skin color, your sex isn't going to keep you out of a Java certification. And it breaks my heart to have to say that, truly, it does. But we've looked at the hard data here today, and to me it seems unquestionable that with GPA already having become as meaningless as it is, and with subsequent graduation rates inflated, with more people not up to snuff at a particular university crowding low degree majors and infecting the entire university system with easy A's, if the SAT now means nothing, college application at all now means nothing beyond what minority group you belong to, so the college can virtue signal and draw thousands more dopes their way, ready to sign their names up for a 20 year loan and a piece of paper like a young naive Motown singer. I was like, oh man, you're gonna give me a whole hundred dollars for all of my songs? Where do I sign, Mr. Barry Gordy? It's a scam at this point, unquestionably. If you're a young person or an adult interested in furthering your education, I've made you wait this long for a reason to tell you about this video sponsor, because I didn't want to overload you with the sponsor before I made the case, and that sponsor is Skillshare. Skillshare is a self-education edification service that allows you to learn at your own pace on an incredibly wide variety of subjects that can help you excel in your career, from design and art to business management and data analysis to literally learning to code. Skillshare offers plenty of free courses that can help give you an edge in the world where degrees now mean next to nothing, or simply to learn a new skill just for fun. I want to personally recommend a free course on visual thinking and data visualization that I found interesting and helpful. By clicking the link in my subscription and signing up, you can get access to courses like this one and get a two month free premium membership that allows you to access all of this content. And that's a lot of content. With over 5 million teachers and 18,000 classes, you can learn just about anything you would want to learn through Skillshare and pretty quickly too. I even started kind of drawing a little bit more again because I loved watching through this series on art and the science of drawing. Check it out. I reached out to Skillshare not really because I wanted to shill, but because I thought it was actually a useful thing for a lot of people while I'm ragging on the university system. So if you're interested, check out the link in my description. It's free to sign up. You have nothing to lose. Only knowledge to gain. 
So before I end, of course, there is a big hashtag I have to put wide and clear here that not all universities and not all programs are as heinous as this all sort of implies. But the problem is that if the SAT becomes unusable, which this adversity index will make it, then there is no empirical method left that has any real validity that would allow universities to properly select the average student. I was very lucky. I attended absolutely excellent higher education institutions, but I think that they are becoming increasingly scarce, and I don't want to see that. But what do you guys think? What do you think about the SAT? Do you think that it's a good predictive source? What about the impacts of socioeconomic status, or race, or sex with the SAT scores? Are they biased? Can we trust GPA in a world where GPA is so heavily inflated? Or you can just fill me on your own personal college experiences in the comments below. I love to hear from you. If you've enjoyed this video, you can support my work in any way you see fit. It truly is your guys' support that gives me the time to make sure I can make these really, really spurgy videos that I sincerely hope you enjoy. You can find links in the description to my Patreon, my Subscribestar, and to my Streamlabs, as well as to a merch store if you want to pick up some t-shirts or mugs. As always, there'll be some links to Amazon books in the description if you want to learn more. If you want to hang out in real life, I will be speaking both at the International Conference on Men's Issues in August in Chicago and at Minds IRL in Pittman, New Jersey, also in August. Finally, if for some reason you want much more of my spedentry, you can catch me every Tuesday on Uncle Lavi's channel where I play Pathfinder, where we're at real Ace Attorney hours right now. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe and consider hitting that bell because no one's getting notifications from me anymore. But most importantly, and as always, all ton of volt. My sweet lover said it wait for me.